the basis buddha nature the main image of dharmadhatu is that of space the space of all things within which all phenomena manifest abide and dissolve back into this is similar to physical space which is like a container within which the remaining four elements appear abide and disappear these four elements do not come out of any other source they emerge from space itself they do not remain anywhere else other than within space neither do they go anywhere outside of space in the same way dharma dhatu is the basic environment of all phenomena whether they belong to samsara or nirvana it encompasses whatever appears and exists including the worlds and all beings everything takes place within and dissolves back into the state of dharma dhatu dharma dhatu encompasses all of samsara and nirvana it doesn't include only nirvana and excludes samsara it's not like that external phenomena appear within space remain within space and disappear within space again is there any place where earth water fire and wind can go that is outside space don't they always remain within space when they disintegrate isn't it within space that they dissolve is there any place at all to go to which it's beyond or outside space which is somewhere other than space please understand very well this symbolic resemblance between dharma dhatu and physical space the relationship between dharma dhatu and dharmakaya and dharma dhatu wisdom is like the relationship between a place a person and a person's mind if there is no place there is no environment for the person to exist and there is no person unless that person also has a mind dwelling in the body in the same way the main field or realm called dharma dhatu has the nature of dharmakaya dharmakaya has the quality of dharma dhatu wisdom which is like the mind aspect we also need to clearly understand what is meant by the terms samsara and nirvana nirvana means the fully realized buddha nature that consists of body speech and mind aspects the body is the essence that simply is speech is its nature the cognizant quality that is vividly present and the mind is the capacity which is radiant these three aspects comprise the basic presence of all buddhas they are none other than their essence nature and capacity all sugatas are of the same identity in the same way samsara is the body speech and mind of all sentient beings which are the deluded expressions of their essence nature and capacity in this way dharma dhatu encompasses all of samsara and nirvana dharma dhatu is adorned with dharmakaya which is endowed with dharma dhatu wisdom this is a brief but very profound statement because dharma dhatu also refers to sugata garva or buddha nature buddha nature is all encompassing this means it is present or basic to all states regardless of whether they belong to samsara or nirvana remember nirvana refers to the body speech and mind of all the awakened ones body is the abiding essence speech is the vividly present nature and mind is the radiant capacity these three the body speech and mind of all the buddhas are also known as the three vajras This Buddha nature is present just as the shining sun is present in the sky. It is indivisible from the three vajras of the awakened state which do not perish or change. Vajra body is the unchanging quality, vajra speech is the unceasing quality and vajra mind is the undiluted, unmistaken quality. So the Buddha nature or dharma dhatu is the three vajras. At the same time its expression manifests as the deluded body speech and mind of all beings in the normal sense of the word body refers to something perishable composed of flesh and blood speech refers to intermittent utterances that come and go and eventually perish and mind refers to thought states and emotions that come and go come and go under the power of dualistic attitude like beads on a rosary These mental states are also transient. Everyone agrees that the body, speech and mind of living beings are constantly changing, continually coming and going. Still, the basis of our ordinary body, speech and mind is the Buddha nature, the dharma dhatu that encompasses all of samsara and nirvana. There isn't a single being for whom this isn't so. Looking from the pure angle, then this Buddha nature is present in every being. the expression of the victorious ones just like the rays of light are present from the sun 
The light is emanated by the sun, isn't it? If it weren't for the sun, there wouldn't be any light. Similarly, the origin of the body, speech and mind of beings is the expression of the Buddha nature that pervades both samsara and nirvana. It is said that all sentient beings are Buddhas, but they are covered by their temporary obscurations. These temporary obscurations are our own thinking. Dharmadhara encompasses all of samsara and nirvana, not just the awakened state of nirvana, but everything, every single thing. The ordinary body, speech and mind of sentient beings temporarily arose from the expression of the qualities of enlightened body, speech and mind. As space pervades, so awareness pervades. If this were not so, then space would pervade, but Rigpa wouldn't. Just like space, Rigpa is all-encompassing, nothing is outside it. Just as the contents and beings are all pervaded by space, Rigpa pervades the minds of beings. Dharmadhatu pervades all of samsara and nirvana. It is essential to start out with a basic understanding of the profundity of what is meant here in order to be able to authentically practice the teaching of the great perfection. Unless we know what is what, at least intellectually, it might seem to us as if sentient beings are disconnected alien entities and we have no idea of where they come from, where they belong, and what they actually are. They are not disconnected at all. The difference between Buddhas and sentient beings lies in the latter's narrowness of scope and attitude. Sentient beings confine themselves to their own limited little area of samsara through their own attitude and thinking. It is said that the difference between the Buddhas and sentient beings is like the difference between the narrowness and the openness of space. Sentient beings are like the space held within a tightly closed fist, while Buddhas are fully open, all-encompassing. Basic space and awareness are innately all-encompassing. Basic space is the absence of mental constructs, while awareness is the knowing of this absence of constructs, recognizing the complete emptiness of mind essence. Space and awareness are inherently indivisible. It is said, when the mother, the basic space of Dharmadhatu, does not stray from her awareness child, have no doubt that they are forever indivisible. The ultimate dharma is the realization of the indivisibility of basic space and awareness. That is the starting point, and that is what is pointed out to begin with. It is essential to understand this, otherwise we might have the feeling that Samantha Vadra and his consort are an old blue man and woman who lived eons ago. It's not like that at all. Samantha Vadra and his consort are the indivisible unity of space and awareness. As you know, the nine gradual vehicles and the four schools of philosophy Vaivashika, Sautrantika, Mind Only, and Middle Way are designed to suit the various mental capacities of different people. The term Great Perfection, on the other hand, implies that everything is included in Dzogchen, that everything is complete. Dzogchen is said to be unexcelled, meaning that there is nothing higher than it. Why is this? It is because of knowing what truly is, to be as it is. The ultimate naked state of Dharmakaya. Isn't that truly the ultimate? Please carefully understand this. The great perfection is totally beyond any kind of pigeonholing anything in any way whatsoever. It is to be utterly open beyond categories, limitations, and the confines of assumptions and beliefs. All the other ways of describing things are confined by categories and limitations. The ultimate destination to arrive at in Dzogchen is the view of the kayas and wisdoms. Listen to this quote. Although everything is empty, the special quality of the Buddha Dharma is to not be empty of the kayas and wisdom. All other systems expound that all things are empty, but truly the intention of the Buddha is to use the word emptiness rather than empty. This is a very important point. For instance, in the Prajnaparamita scriptures, you find the statements, Outer things are emptiness, inner things are emptiness, emptiness is emptiness. Emptiness, the vast is emptiness, the ultimate is emptiness, the conditioned is emptiness, the unconditioned is emptiness. Emptiness here should be understood as empty cognizance. Please understand this. The suffix ness implies the cognizant quality. We need to understand this word in its correct connotation. Otherwise, it sounds too nihilistic to simply say that outer things are empty. If you understand emptiness as empty or void, rather than empty cognizance, 
we are leaning too much towards nihilism, the idea that everything is a big blank void. This is a serious sidetrack. The Buddha initially taught that all things are empty. This was unavoidable, indeed it was justifiable, because we need to dismantle our fixation on the permanence of what we experience. A normal person clings to the contents of his experiences as solid, as being that on the course, not just as mere experience, but as something which has solidity, which is real, which is concrete and permanent. But if we look honestly and closely at what happens, experience is simply experience and it is not made out of anything whatsoever. It has no form, no sound, no color, no taste and no texture. It is simply experience and empty cognizance. The vivid display in manifold colors you see with open eyes is not mind, but illuminated matter on the course. Similarly, when you close your eyes and see something dark, it is not mind, but dark matter on the course. In both cases, matter is merely a presence, an experience of something. It is mind that experiences the external elements and everything else. An appearance can only exist if there is a mind that beholds it. The beholding on the course of that appearance is nothing other than experience. That is what actually takes place. Without a perceiver, how could an appearance be an appearance? It wouldn't exist anywhere. Perceptions are experienced by mind. They are not experienced by water or earth. All the elements are vividly distinguished as long as the mind fixates on them. Yet they are nothing but a mere presence, an appearance. It is mind that apprehends this mere presence. When this mind doesn't apprehend, hold or fixate on what is experienced, in other words, when the real, authentic samadhi of suchness dawns within your stream of being, reality, under quotes, loses its solid, obstructing quality. That is why accomplished yogis cannot be burned, drowned or harmed by wind. In their experience, all appearances are a mere presence, since fixation has disintegrated from within. Mind is that which experiences, that within which experience unfolds. What else is there to experience? Mind means individual experience. All experience is individual, personal. For instance, the fact that one yogi's delusion dissolves doesn't mean everyone else's delusion vanishes as well. When someone gets enlightened, that person is enlightened, not everyone else. When a yogi transcends fixation, only the deluded individual experience of that one person dissolves. Please think about this. There is, however, another aspect called other's experience on the course or the general experience on the course of sentient beings. In all of this seemingly solid reality, Rinpoche knocks on the wood of his bed. There is not a single thing that is indestructible. Whatever is material in this world will be destroyed in fire at the end of the kalpa. There is no exception. This fire then vanishes by itself. <laughs> Rinpoche chuckles. Try to spend some time on Nangjang training and you will discover that all of reality is insubstantial and unreal. By means of Nanjang training, we discover that all experience is personal experience and that all personal experience is seen as unreal and insubstantial when not fixated upon. In this entire world, there is no created appearance that ultimately remains. Seemingly external visual forms do not really remain anyway. These mere perceptions are dependent karmic experiences. All of relative reality is by definition dependent upon something other, upon causes and conditions, isn't it? When explaining relative phenomena, you have to mention their causes and conditions. There is no way around that. In the end, we realize that their nature is ultimately beyond causes and conditions. What is ultimate, on the quotes, cannot possibly be made out of causes and conditions. Only the authentic state of Samadhi can purify or clear off this self-created confusion. More appearances and further fixating will not destroy this. This profound state is present in each individual, if only they would know it. The ultimate nature is already fully present. It is given names like Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nirmanakaya. Our deluded state hides this from us, but really it is this which destroys the illusion. Isn't this really amazing? Rinpoche chuckles. Once we attain stability in Samadhi, delusion is destroyed, since Samadhi dismantles the entire drama of delusion. In other words, this mind has basically created the delusion. But by recognizing the nature of this mind, 
we clear up our delusion since at that moment no delusion can be recreated if everyone could just understand this this is amazing rinpoche laughs <laughs> it is the mind itself that creates this whole delusion but it is also the mind itself that can let the whole delusion collapse rinpoche laughs again <laughs> Besides Buddha nature, what else is there to be free from delusion? Buddha nature is the very basis for delusion. It is also that which dissolves the delusion. Please try carefully to understand this. This is something you can understand. Delusion seems to separate all sentient beings from their Buddha nature, but it is this very Buddha nature that clears off the delusion. It is basically a matter of recognizing it or not. We speak of those who were never deluded. the buddhas and the hundred sublime families of peaceful and wrathful sugatas including buddha samantabhadra when failing to recognize one is deluded delusion dissolves the very moment you recognize the identity of that which is deluded delusion is like becoming possessed by a spirit in during a seance when someone starts to suddenly hop around and do all kinds of crazy things this is exactly what has happened to all of us Sentient beings are possessed by the spirit undercurrents of ignorance and the 84000 disturbing emotions and they are all dancing around doing incredible things they have undergone all different kinds of pain and misery for so long eons upon eons but it is a self created possession it is not really something from outside buddha nature has lost track of itself and created samsara but it is also buddha nature recognizing itself which clears off the delusion of samsaric existence the moment of recognition is like the spirit living all of a sudden the possession vanishes we can even say where it went this is called the collapse of confusion we have undergone so much misery oh my spinning around on the wheel of samsara we have suffered so much trouble roaming and rambling about among the six classes of beings of course we have suffered rimpoche laughs, laughs A yogi is like a formerly possessed person whom the spirit has left. While possessed, on the course, the mind thinks and acts in delusion. But the very moment you recognize the nature of this mind, rigpa, the possession immediately vanishes. Rimpuche laughs. laughs.